Uh, Mr. Scott, will you please share information about this item? Okay, thank you. Um, you've heard me kind of go through all of this, so I'm not going to rehash it again tonight. What I will do is kind of follow up with some some homework assignments I had from last time. Primarily, I think several of you were interested in seeing examples of you know, properties of mission and how they fit into uh, the proposed um, definitions for the future okay. land use map. So can you pull up that the map or the, the examples? <laughs> yeah, the land use map examples. Should be a Word document. All scrambled. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you enlarge it so we can see it? Or <laughs> I have a copy. Yeah. Emily, there's also a split screen up on our screen. So if you can put it all on the content, that might help. Yeah. Okay, well, so in the world of planning, we try to make apples to apples comparisons. So that's often why we use the dwelling units per acre as part of that definition. So what I had done in the memo that I provided to you all in your packet was to go through and find examples in mission that met um, the different definitions uh, for the future land use map that are proposed in the study. And the first one is low density residential. And the first example was 6504 Woodson Drive, which is just a single family ranch home in Millhaven. And that actually sits on a lot that's 0.29 in acres. So it's roughly a little bit over a quarter of an acre, about a third of an acre. So that translates to 3.5 units per acre. So you can kind of imagine, you know, just a single family ranch style home um, coming the south side of town, that would translate to about 3.5 units per acre, which would fit the definition for low density residential of three to six dwelling units per acre. Likewise, I found a home on the far north side of Mission, um, 5324 Woodson Drive, which is a 0.12 acre. And so that actually translates to 8.3 units per acre. So if you can imagine a full acre, you could have eight of those dwelling units on that acre. And then I found some examples of five family homes or essentially duplexes. Again, one kind of on the south side of 6309. Um, which would translate to about 8.6 dwelling units, counting the two for the for the buy attached. And then the other one was on the north side is 6370 and 6368 West 49th Street. And that was about 3.4 dwelling units per acre, again, counting for that buy attached. And then for the medium density residential, I found a number of examples in Kennett Place, Roland Court Townhomes, Lincolnshire, and Lita Villas. 
And all of those are right around about nine to 11 units uh, per acre. And the high density residential, um, one example is um, the Silverwood Apartments at 5100 Fox Ridge. Um, that's actually a 14, almost 15 acre parcel of property with 280 units total. So that translates to 18 units per acre. Then on the flip side, 5718 Outlook is um, kind of a typical three-story, a small apartment building that we typically see around downtown, kind of on the north side of downtown. There's several examples like that building on Outlook, then on 57th Street, 58th Street, excuse me. And that building is three stories, has 17 units, and it sits on 0.4 acres, a little bit less than half an acre. So again, kind of doing an apples apples comparison, that'd be 42 units per acre. So that would actually fit high density residential, that definition. And for mixed use high density, um, the best two examples are the locale of 6201 Johnson Drive, which is um, a 2.7 acre site, 200 units, that's 74 units per acre. And then the uh, Lanes of Mission Bowl, I think that's the latest name, right? Um, it's 5399 Martway Street. That's a 3.2 acre site. That's 176 units, so that's 55 units per acre. I could find no examples in Mission of a mixed use medium density. If you all have an idea, that'd be great. Because I really started to scratch my head. I couldn't find anything that it was truly a mixed use in the sense that it includes pedestrian friendly mix of housing, office, and retail uses at medium densities. So then that definition that's provided um, currently in the draft of, of one to three FAR for retail office and 12 to 45 dwelling units per acre. So those are some of the examples that I found. Um, I'm not really open up for questions. If any of you have questions or clarification of something, or you'd like to discuss something. Go ahead, Council Member Davis. So it's my understanding that you're recommending that we modify the Planning Commission recommendation to keep the existing um, density Correct. per acre. Is yeah. that? Yes. So to stay with those definitions, including the mixed use medium density, which the planning commission had recommended changing status recommendation, recommendation is to stay with what's in the proposed draft. And I am supportive of the staff's recommendation to keep the existing density. Okay. Other questions, comments? Council Member Boltinghouse. Just a note of gratitude. Thanks for putting the pictures in. I know we had talked about that at a previous discussion, so that that helped. Yeah, definitely. Glad to do it. So the, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Council Member Davis, did you have a question? Well, our, your our intent right now is to bring this to the City Council next week for consideration and um did you want to have Mr. Shires here? I I kind of had him pencil it in, but. I think that depends. Do you all have a large appetite for questions or comments or anything like that? Were there any concerns anybody wanted to bring up this evening? Yeah, I wanted Davis? you to finish your, what you had. And that, was I was gonna... that was my thought. <laughs> okay. I did send an email to the chair and vice chair mm -hmm. of the committee and to Sally, Mayor Sally. And uh, also to Brian and Laura, um, I would like to have the consideration of a very small parcel. If you look at um, page 21 of the uh, future plan use comparison from what it is to what it would be in the future. 
Can you pull that up at all? Uh, let me just go ahead and explain. Um, the parcel that's to the north of Anderson Park, uh, basically between Dearborn and Beverly and south of Martway, is, is a section that used to be uh, zoned as office. It's where the Pizza Hut buildings are right now. And the issue that I wanted to have discussed tonight is about six years ago, we had a proposal for a high uh, high density, I think it was a high density um, building that was gonna go in there. It's partially on floodplain. And so that means that parking would have to be under the building. There's not a lot of room for that to accommodate four story apartment building there. And it's my understanding that Millhouse, who's being the developer for the Beverly site across from um, Sylvester Powell is planning on having that be lower profile buildings in that area that would be residential in nature. Now we have treated um, the proximity, for instance, north of Johnson Drive, immediately adjacent to the residential areas as uh, medium density. And so what I would like the council to, or the committee to consider, uh, since it's been now labeled in the future use to be high density, I would like to propose that that section that little island area be reduced to medium density residential rather than high density residential. Uh, there was a lot of controversy at the time that that building was being proposed. Many of you were not here at the time. Some of you were witness to it. Um, and I don't know if Brian, do you wanna talk a little bit about that proposal at the time? Got it. Okay. Just one thing to know while we're passing those out is that the, the parcels to the north of what you're talking about, Ken, are, are mixed use medium density, which actually align with the residential high density to some degree. They both start at 12 units per acre. So it's, I think, a little maybe confusing that they are kind of parallel, but I, I certainly agree that there's a, you know, at least in the past, some community pressure to, to reduce that. So I'd like to yeah, so have the discussion. Before we walk through, and I'll let Brian walk through because he took the time to put together kind of this comparison of of that site in particular. But I think it's important as we go into this discussion because I often forget as we talk about the comp plan. So the future land use map is not zoning, right? Um, it is uh, it is an identification of anticipated future land use. So there are. All man. So, for example, the parcel that Councilmember Davis is referencing is currently zoned MS2, <clears throat> which allows for up to 35 dwelling units per acre um, under the current zoning proposal. And so that that would sort of align. So we aren't actively going to pursue rezoning of any parcels in this. Um, you know, so you could change the. The definition on a future land use map, but it doesn't uh, impact immediately the underlying zoning of the project um, here or any of the other. Same thing. So the, the things that are shown north of Johnson Drive um, are not rezoned that currently in many cases. Um, so, we, you know, we've rezoned, for example, where uh, Moffitt's project, the 58 and all project was, we rezoned that to downtown neighborhood district, which I believe allows for up to 50 units per acre immediately across the street from that that single family residential. So as we looked at this, I think, and from staff's perspective and, and thinking about um, some of those things, we feel like the the park and the creek create a natural barrier uh, and some of that buffer similarly to the lanes at Mission Bowl and um, the single family properties to the south of that. But um, it just kind of, using some of that as context, Brian, if you would kind of walk through your handout and just kind of look at the 
iteration of um, the proposals that have come forward over the last several years for the Martway apartments. And I think we've uh, really worked to be responsive to the neighborhood concerns that we've heard, you know, as we've worked with two different developers uh, on that parcel and trying to bring a project in that that probably accomplishes that. So if you will, Brian, kind of walk through. Right. So the first page says Marway office buildings and there's an aerial view of what's essentially the three buildings. We call them the Pizza Hut buildings, defection on Martway. Um, as they presently exist today. And then the second page, Martway Office Buildings, again, gives a little information about that. Um, all three of those lots combined is 1.67 acres. And those properties, all the properties along Martway, on both sides of Martway, are zoned Main Street 2 or MS2. And the height restriction currently in the zoning code is three stories and or 45 feet. And that and or has always been a little bit of a trip point. So we've kind of interpreted that to say, it can be three stories or 45 feet. And if you can squeeze four stories into 45 feet, go for it. <laughs> and then the minimum lot area per multifamily dwelling unit, again, the number of dwelling units allowed per acre is essentially 35 units per acre. So that's the current zoning. Now, if you go to the, would be the third page, five-story Martway apartment building proposed September of 2017, but not approved. This was the original development project that was proposed by Mr. Christian Arnold of Clockwork Architecture. And he was working with a, a development group, uh, but he was kind of the, the presenter and his architectural firm had designed this building. He was proposing a five-story building, all residential with a little bit of retail on the ground floor on all three of those parcels. And the ground floor would be primarily parking with a little bit of retail, like I said, facing Martway. Then the remaining four stories above would all be residential. So kind of going to that Next page, five-story Martway apartment building, proposed Martway Apartments preliminary development plan, denied September 25th, 2017. The proposed height was five stories at 67 feet. And the proposed density was 156 units for a total of 93 units per acre. And so, um, as Laura was kind of alluding to, there was quite a bit of concern from the neighborhood to the south about just the height of the building and the density of it. So Mr. Arnold um, kind of went back to the drawing board and this was denied by the planning commission. So Mr. Arnold went back to the drawing board and he came back about three months later in early 2018 with the proposal for a four story building. And that's the smaller building you see in the fourth or fifth page here. And it was four stories at 45 feet exactly. So he was able to kind of get it right underneath the 45 foot limit. And it was 90 units total or 54 units per acre. So there was still a deviation on the number of units per acre, but had gone down quite a bit from 90. Um, that ultimately was recommended by the planning commission for approval and it was approved by the city council. So in theory, he could build that today if you wanted to. So he has the right to do that. Um, he was never able to make the numbers work at 90 units. So he's had the property on the market for several years. And I think he has a relationship now with Millhouse, a part, uh, Millhouse Development Company to sell the property. So if you go to three-story Millhouse Apartment Building B, proposed for Martway office building site, that is a perspective if, as if you're standing on Martway, kind of at the corner of um, Beverly and Martway, right by the community center, and you're looking east towards uh, Woodson. And what you see on your right would be the Martway office buildings or that site and the building that Millhouse is proposing, which is three stories at 38 and 11, almost 12 feet almost 39 stories, this is about half an inch shy, 39 feet, excuse me, this is about half inch shy 
Yeah, not 38 stories, no. Just three stories. Um, the proposed density would be exactly 35 units per acre. So it's right on the money. Um, that building on the left, which would be essentially the site where the motor bank is now and a small office building, and then the Dearborn office building a little bit further north in the empty lot. Um, that would be a four-story building. And that would be at 54 feet, so about a nine-foot deviation. And um, their, their number of units is kind of a moving target. So I'm kind of looking at some old information they submitted last fall. Um, but I'm counting about 210 units in that building or 81 units per acre. So a deviation of about 46 per 46 units per acre. So there is some some requested deviation on that older that building to the north. Um, but if you'll all remember, we had an open house last fall, I think September, and um, we invited the neighbors from around to come and visit. And there wasn't a real strong opposition. A couple of the neighbors I spoke with kind of felt like if you can keep the building on the south side of Martway at three stories, I'm good. So. But that would fit within the definition of high density residential. <laughs> and that would include even that three story project, Brian? Yeah. To be 12 or more units, dwelling units per acre. You know, high density residential. And even the mixed use medium density, 12 to 45 dwelling units per acre. So. As it's currently zoned right now, that would be the definition that building would fit in. Mayor Flora? Yeah, I, I just had a comment, a couple of comments, and thank you, Brian, for that. And thank you for Laura for explaining the zoning difference. But I just didn't want us to lose sight of what the definitions are in the proposal for medium density residential and high density residential. So if you look at page 17 on the comprehensive plan, Medium density residential is really intended intended for those duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and courtyard apartments. But I think when we looked at this before, none of our existing courtyard apartments are actually small enough to qualify as medium density residential. So if you think of the smaller apartment buildings in, you know, in Ward 2 and around downtown, those are all technically high density residential under the definitions. And so... I think if we were to move this to medium density residential, we're really saying that on a prime commercial corridor, a transit art artery that Martway is, that what we're really wanting in the future for that site is basically townhomes. And I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. I know that the high density residential gives a big range and that it's 12 or more dwelling units per acre. I think we're always going to be in a position, even if it were rezoned at some point in the future, um, you know, to work with the developer on that, but that it makes more sense to have a little more density on that site. And you can always say, you know, a five-story building is not going to work. You know, we want it, want it to be lower density than that. But I think, you know, with the current three-story proposal, that's smaller than what was proposed before. And that's still going to fall in as high density in our code. I don't think it makes sense to change that um, in a sort of prime area going forward. Any other questions or comments on that? Oh, yeah, Councilmember Thomas. I would like to hear from Councilmember Davis, and if you're willing to share more of your thoughts, um, I do remember those conversations well. And you know, not that we want to necessarily create a a problem that doesn't yet exist potentially on on that corner. I think what I'm hearing you say is really looking for that mechanism that we can later gather from zoning to ensure that we can make sure that we keep some of those restrictions so we don't rise above three or whatever we need for that corner. Laura, are you saying that that's something that we're able to help make happen when we get to the zoning process? Well, the current zoning at MS2, it limits it to three stories or the 35 dwelling units per acre. So anything above that would be a deviation that would specifically have to then be granted uh, recommended by the planning commission and granted by the city council. Um, so that that sort of check and balance, I think, exists currently with the underlying 
zoning that's in place on that parcel. Um, I think, again, as as Mayor Flores said, I think if we look at this and that MS2 zoning really was reflective of the fact that this is a, a commercial corridor and in many ways, and we look at, um, but we've also seen through kind of the iteration, and I think Brian's um, presentation illustrates that, that the finances of a, that that size of parcel in trying to accomplish something without a larger assemblage of property like the Millhouse project would propose makes it we will probably be faced with more deviation requests in the future to see what we want than if if we were to look at it or consider it as it sort of moves through with this current iteration of the project which I think checks a lot of those boxes that we were hoping you know, hoping to see um Laura just to clarify that three-story proposal would be aligned with the high density residential definition that's currently in the plan right yes. not with the medium density correct even at three stories yeah council member davis i appreciate the clarification and i also appreciate the fact that there's a difference between the zoning and this future planning so i accept that i also except the fact that the staff is working with developers to keep the height of that property low. And so I'll withdraw my recommendation. I think we've heard that message. I mean, I think we're trying to be responsive to that. And again, I think you can always have a developer who would come in and potentially ask for a rezoning. But again, that's not automatic, even regardless of what the future land use map might say. That is sort of that check as as you're looking at and evaluating proposals, how does this align with you know, what we envision for this area? But I think the protections from a staff perspective, we feel like are in place and give you and the planning commission both a great deal of sort of flexibility um, to really consider each project on a case-by-case -case basis to determine if you want to consider those deviations. I also want to thank Ryan for putting this together. Thank you. Yes, indeed. And and to sum up, I think, you know, we, we have a situation where the, the proposal, the, the Southern building that's proposed now in the Millhouse project, you know, it fits the land use, it fits the zoning, and no, we haven't had major objections to it. So if that's the worst we can do, um, okay. Any other questions or comments before we get off this topic? Council Member Thomas? Sure. Yeah, I just want to share, I had shared with the mayor and um, Laura that in a perfect world, we wouldn't have um, the comprehensive plan being voted on um, in a transition of committees to a new council. Um, but I understand the um, urgency to, to, get it, to get it going. And we're really lucky that Brian and Cheryl are hyper engaged. And so they've been following for the mm -hmm. past four years as everybody's. And so I fully recognize that. And I appreciate Lauren and Solly um, making me feel a little bit better about that. My last other comment, Brian, just a quick question. You said that um, a developer could build that original PDP that was approved back in 2018. How long is that PDP um, active? I thought it was five years. So I was just five curious. Years. Yeah, that. I've started writing that into ordinances that approve the PDP. <laughs> I've actually started having PDPs approved by ordinance. We weren't doing that before. So. And so, Brian, procedurally, um, if we're going to not accept a, a recommendation from the commission next week, is that going to be a supermajority vote? Correct. Okay. Yep. And then, <clears throat> since it's going straight to the governing body, technically, um, you know, if, if we were going to raise any amendments or recommendations, <clears throat> formally be done next next week council member crane i have a question it may deviate from the conversation but it I've, I've been questioning this for a while based on the number of apartments that we're adding if all those were filled and say some of them three bedroom three people per unit does that does a rental apartment complex add to our number of people that live in the city yes I mean, okay so potentially it could go from 9,720 to 13 or 14,000. Is that correct? I mean, I'm, yeah. Okay. Possibly, yeah, give it all the apartments, yeah, mm -hmm. the units, yeah. Anything else on this topic? All right. And if I may, speaking of being um, engaged, I see a number of students in the audience tonight. So thank you all for being here. It's good to have you. Please feel free to raise your hand, ask questions anytime. 
Um, let's move on to our next planning item. Uh, our second item tonight coming forward from the Planning Commission is approval of a final plat for Popeyes on Johnson Drive at 6821 Johnson Drive. Mr. Scott. Okay. Um, we had a preliminary development plan before you all recently for a new Popeyes restaurant on Johnson Drive. This would replace the current Popeyes restaurant that was on uh, severely damaged in a fire about 11 months ago. Um, so that was approved by you all, and they have quickly come back for a final development plan, which was considered by the city cons or planning commission, excuse me, uh, last month, November 27th, and approved. And at that time, the planning commission also considered a final plat presented by Popeyes, um, which was recommended for approval to you all by a vote of seven to zero. And the final plat um, is really, the property was never platted before. So this is kind of a formality, but in doing so we are dedicating more right away along Johnson Drive. So we're essentially uh, matching the width of the sidewalk that's to the east, uh, kind of along that, that block down to Barkley. And that would be the, um, the Cornerstone Commons development with the natural grocers and uh, some of the restaurants that were in there. So we just kind of want to even all that up. So we asked for that additional right away and they were gracious enough to provide that to us. So that's reflected in this, this plat. That's it. Questions or comments? Okay. Um, our final item tonight coming forward from the Planning Commission <clears throat> is consideration of a special use permit for a digital billboard at 6650 West 47th Street, Mr. Scott. Okay, where is 6650th West 47th Terrace? Um, that is actually a property that's located on the north side of I-35. So um, I-35 kind of does a sort of diagonal slice across the northwest corner of Mission. And there's a little partial parcel or portion of mission that's actually on the north side of I-35. And there's several parcels of property that are almost split in half. They're half in Mission, half in Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. And this is one of those. Um, I believe it's currently the site of a, um, a tire store, kind of a commercial tire business. And the owners are interested in leasing a portion of their front yard for the installation of a digital billboard. And um, digital billboards are permitted in the city with a special use permit. So our sign ordinance defines a digital billboard, um, a billboard which has a computer controlled board that displays an image through the use of light emitting diode display LED or similar technology. And then there's another section that speaks to prohibited signs, outdoor advertising, such as poster panels, billboards, and offsite promotional signs, except where a special use permit has been obtained for such a sign. And then In case of signs permitted by issuance of a special use permit, all signs shall be approved by the city council after recommendation from the planning commission, except where private sign criteria may be previously approved, which wouldn't be the case here. So then going to the, um, the section of our zoning code for special use permits, billboards are permitted with a special use permit in all districts except residential districts, which um, actually kind of surprised me a little bit. <laughs> This is really about the only viable location for a billboard. Um, and it should be noted further that there are some federal regulations which um, essentially kind of hand the power of regulating billboards to the state. And the state of Kansas does have a requirement that um, billboards that are located along interstate highways, which I-35 is, are required to get a permit from the state of Kansas. And then they have some requirements for um, the height of the billboard and especially digital billboards, the amount of time that the display can be on and then 
with time and it's a lot of for changing of the display or the image. So, so we reviewed all of this. Um, this property is also in a floodplain, which could be a potential issue. Um, we asked that they give us what was called a no rise letter, which essentially showed that placing a billboard or structure of that type in the floodplain would not have a negative impact on the surrounding properties. So their engineers studied that and provided that no rise letter. Um, so this planning commission took all this under consideration of the public hearing. There was no, um, no one in the audience that raised any questions or objections to the special use permit. And it was approved by seven to zero to be recommended to the city council with a number of stipulations that are outlined in the special, in the ordinance for the special use permit. With that, I will answer any questions. Questions or comments? Council Member Thomas and then the mayor. Yeah, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, I noticed one of the stipulations was if it becomes abandoned that the special use permit goes away in six months. Is, mm -hmm. what, is there any sort of ability to take it down if it becomes abandoned over a certain period of time? It, like take the actual, not just take the special use permit away, but take the bill, the billboard down. Yeah. Yeah. We would, um, we would basically ask them to dismantle the, the billboard and take it down completely. If they did not do that within a specified time period, we could probably take it in the municipal court, probably just take it down ourselves, then charge a lien back to the property owner. So, yeah, but there's provisions in our zoning code for termination of special use permits, um, non-compliance with the applicable requirements, non-compliance with any special conditions imposed at the time of the approval, uh, violation of the provisions of the codes pertaining to the use of the land, the procedures for revocation, revocation proceedings may be initiated by a majority vote of the governing body, unless the permittee or landowner agree in writing that the permittee may be Permit may be revoked. The governing body shall hold a public hearing. Um, there's some provisions for the public hearing itself. So, yeah. The next question, if that's okay. Yeah, go is ahead. Okay. Um, just not, you know, being able to study the the map super well because I don't understand maps like that super well. Um, but the direction of it is facing, I'm assuming, towards drivers. Um, that, okay. I'm just, I'm also thinking about the falls apartments residents who are, you know, really just right, mm -hmm. not that far and elevated above it. And thinking about the direction of that, that light, if it were even just tilted a little bit for some of those folks who could have some light pollution coming in their windows. I know it seems far away. They've already got the highway, all of that, but just thinking about those folks as well. Um, and then last question, not necessarily about the digital billboard this one, but you said that only on interstate, or I'm sorry, just not in residential areas. So we could technically have billboards in commercial districts in Mission? Correct, yeah. Would that not then ping back to you know, like uh, uh, pole sign conversations, which flashbacks to many years ago? Yeah, but, pole signs are defined a little bit differently yeah. in the zoning code and- Interesting. Yeah, okay. that kind of should be tightened up a little bit. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Mayor Flora. Yeah, Brian, it's been a while since we've had a special use permit like this. So I had a question, and I don't think we've ever had a billboard like this, but a question about the um, criteria that are required. Um, and the way, it, the way it reads in our packet or from the staff memo for the planning commission is that the planning commission and city council shall give consideration to pertinent criteria. And then it lists, sorry, let me see how many it is, 13, 14 criteria. Mm -hmm. Um do all criteria have to support the grant or is it supposed to be a balancing of all of the criteria? And the reason why I'm asking is under the staff report. So it's page 37 of our packet, but okay. it says staff does not identify a need or economic need for the use in the commit community. And factors 12 and 13 are the extent to which there is a need for the use in the community and the economic impact of the proposed use of the community. And as I was review reviewing this, I didn't really see, I agreed with staff that I couldn't identify a need 
or a positive economic impact um, of this. So I was wondering if there's no real benefit to the community, you know, why would it be granted or are you looking at all the factors together or I, how's that to work? I don't think you can really clearly look at all of these 14 factors and check everyone off for every special use permit. Okay. Um, it's really kind of a balance. Um, the economic impact of the proposed use on the community will probably get a nominal amount of property tax on that, but you know, it wouldn't be a, a big benefit to the city or the community, uh, but that'd be like, the only economic impact I could think of. But I think it's really kind of looking at these in totality, not okay. each individual one and just kind of checking the box off on all of them. But is the idea in granting a special use permit to get something that's of benefit to the city, or is it more about the individual property rights, or it's, again, kind of a balance between? It's kind of a balance, yeah. Okay. You don't want something that's going to be detrimental to the city. You, know, you don't want to be you know, a quarry or a landfill or something like that that's going to have a negative impact. But then the question becomes, what would be the negative impact of a billboard or a drinking establishment or something like that? So it's kind of trying to weigh that and just balancing that out a little bit. Councilmember Loudon. So what if the content of the billboard ended up being objectionable? I mean, would we have any say in that? Yeah, you can't have anything obscene. So no signs can have anything that's obscene. And how do you define obscene? <laughs> You know, it's just, but the Supreme Court has clearly said that we cannot regulate content of any sign. Anything else from the committee? Yeah, Council Member Kring. Do we have an idea from the owner what the intent of the digital billboard was? I mean, what's, what is their intent? I assume it's to it's lease just, to an advertising company. Yeah, or, they've or, got a front yard and they see an opportunity for some revenue for themselves by leasing it out to an advertisement company. So it'd be like a Lamar type billboard we see along the highway and it'll have a series of different advertisements that flash up for Rotor Rooter, Olathe Ford, whatever they want to advertise on there that people are willing to pay for. Okay, so uh, the city really has no... I agree with Leah. I mean, no jurisdiction over what it will, I mean, if it's, I, I don't, that puts us in kind of an awkward position, I think. Yeah, that's, the Supreme Court has clearly stated that sign ordinances cannot regulate content. So. So even if it were to advertise, I don't know, a strip club or can't something. Can't regulate it, yeah. Guns, yeah. Guns, yep. Okay. Cannot regulate it. Council Member Thomas. Now, if it were show a nude woman, you might say it's obscene and that can't be on there. But if it's a strip club, that can't be regulated. It's yeah. a fine line. Yeah, it's a fine line. Yeah. Right. Um, do we have any other billboards admission along that I-35 stretch? No. No, so this would be our first one. Okay, and great. And um, Probably our only one. <laughs> okay. And apologies again, that map was difficult for me to interpret. Mm -hmm. um, do, on there, was there any designation of where the next closest billboard was? Well, or the state next regulation billboard? requires that billboards have a minimum distance of a thousand feet. That's so, all. yeah, if you okay. put That'd a billboard that. right there, you know, yeah. across the street or mm -hmm. the other side of the highway, that's it. There's no, okay. no room for anything else, admission sure. at least. Sure. Yeah. I personally don't love this idea and um not sure where I'll be in a week, but um just sharing my thoughts for the council. If nothing else, I'll share my thoughts. I, I think my main concern comes from a safety angle. Um I, I reviewed the staff report in depth and the the uh the federal highway report that was in the staff report. Um started doing a little bit more research on that and was not terribly convinced. Um that these are necessarily a, a good idea to just put up along a busy interstate. Um, I, I came across some additional research that I've sent to Laura. It's obnoxiously thick, so I didn't really, <laughs> we'll make it available. The point is, it's a compendium of all the research that's been done more or less since this federal highway study that was given to the California Department of Transportation. 
And it, it made me rather uncomfortable with the idea of, of uh, digital billboards along an interstate highway. So that's my main concern. Um, I think a number of other things you all have brought up are, are definitely relevant, the light pollution. Um, and, you know, to the extent we're going to look at the criteria for, for planning decisions specifically, you know, one of them is, does the use detrimentally affect nearby property? Well, there's a thousand foot boundary. Nobody else can do it if they do it. So um, that's what I had. My, my main concern is uh, this is a high speed, you know, highway, high volume, six lanes with interchanges on both sides. Um, I think the, the, the life safety impact rises above everything else to me. Council Member Kring. Dan, do you want to weigh in on this? There are uh, similar billboards, I think, just as you cross into the Overland Park slash Merriam, and I don't think it's it's impacted anything along I-35 that has led to any more wrecks than there already are in that section of I-35. Council Member Bolting House. Yeah, um, my thoughts about it are, are, I guess, less around safety and just more of a general beautification aesthetic element. Um, you know, there's already so much square space of advertising that's out there everywhere. And, you know, adding yet another drop in that gigantic bucket doesn't really sound that appealing to me. Um, so that's kind of right now where I'm leaning. Maybe, like Hillary said, in a week I'll feel differently, but just not crazy about the idea at the moment. I think there is enough research out there. I was surprised by it. And yes, we only have a sliver of interstate in the corner of mission, but on the flip side, that's the part I get to vote on, not the rest of the world. So um, I, I would, I, I, I will be, share that. I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but I I could start picking some choice quotes out of here that I think would, would at least make you think twice. Um, so we'll share that. Uh, Council member shows he share that with me this yeah. afternoon. And so we, um, no one would have had time to read it prior to coming to tonight's meeting, but we'll make yeah. sure it's out there and you have the opportunity to review that prior to next week's consideration. Thank you, Laura. I think some of the, the really quick main takeaways that I came off of it were that a, a number of the studies in here were mentioning how the risk increases with uh, higher speeds, more lane changes, um, more demanding road and traffic conditions, and uh, how the impact is, um, let's see, young and elderly drivers are the most susceptible to uh, distraction. So when it comes to these billboards, um, yeah, that's any other comments on this. Otherwise we can council member Thomas. Sorry, last comment. I was more concerned about the aesthetic piece and now a little bit more concerned about the safety piece. I, I wasn't really thinking, I think that's the stretch of highway where you have to move from the far right lane. If you're heading to the airport, you know, or getting on 635 for whatever reason, you have to move over, you know, for, plus lanes in about a thousand feet in between one billboard to the next. You know, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's that stretch. And so just thinking about what's happening already on that highway and yeah. what's going on for folks. Just one other last minute thought. It, it's between the the Lamar interchange and the, the 635 interchange. So I think if I'm hearing you right, just a little further east of that, but to me still a pretty um, intense stretch of interstate for the city. I'm sorry, who else had their hand up? Oh, I had mine yeah. up. And that's, I guess, kind of where I get sick is the stuck is I don't see a big, well, I don't see really any benefit to mission. I can see how there would be a benefit to the individual property owner. And it does seem like there could be some negatives for the community at large, but. Anything else on this item? Okay. Let's move along. And our first action item this evening would be acceptance of the meeting minutes with Robin Folks. Thank you. Draft minutes of the November 1st Community Development Committee meeting are included for review and acceptance in your packet tonight. Any comments or recommendation? Councilmember Davis? I wasn't at the meeting, so I really am not going to act on this, but I did want to point out on page six, the, the last paragraph, uh, there's a word that says bylines on the first line of that paragraph should be Barry. We'll get that make that change made. Thank you. For the comments or a recommendation. Somebody's got to do it. 
Sure. So we take it to count, or I think we should take it to council and put it on the consent agenda. Okay. Next item, um, number five, we will consider the Rock Creek Channel preliminary project study report with Brent Morton. Hi, Brent. Thank you very much. Um, this is the Rock Creek uh, preliminary project study or PPS. I also have Brad with me from Olson, who's got a quick presentation after I go through this, just to get a little more in depth on the actual PPS study. Um, Johnson County Stormwater Management Program, or SMP, uh, completed the Stormwater Master Plan in March of 2022, and looking at it from a watershed hole um, instead of city to city. Um, through that process, um, they came up with uh, focus areas uh, for flooding, erosion, um, hydro modifications, and uh, water quality. Uh, one of those focus areas was in Mission Focus Area 2, um, and that's between Woodson and Reeds Road. Um, it had a 4.4 .4, uh, risk score out of 5 for flooding, um, which leads us to the PPS study uh, through the county for funding. Um, so to address a stormwater project like that, you got to go through the preliminary project study to submit a project of this size to the county for review for potential funding at a 50% 50, 50 cost share for design and construction. Um, we uh, submitted or council approved a task force with Olson in September of 2022 to do the preliminary project study uh, to eventually submit it to the county for a potential project. Um, the PPS has been completed. They uh, came up with four options. Um, they look at a risk factor and a cost effect effect ah, sorry efficiency score uh to determine which project benefits uh the county and the city at the same time um, that has been completed staff is recommending alternative three which is lowering the creek channel from woodson to reeds uh, upsizing the box culvert at woodson and then replacing uh or upsizing both replacing upsizing both bridges at uh, reeds and outlook as well um it's got a lot of benefits to the city. Those are our two worst bridges in town. I just got the bridge, bridge inventory back uh, two days ago and they're both rated as six at this point. So there's not a lot of funding mechanisms for a city our size to replace those kind of bridges. So this really helps us out long-term uh, with those bridge replacements as well. Um, getting a 50%, potential 50% cost share from the county with the project this size. Uh, the estimated total project cost is uh, $9,300,000. Um, it's scheduled and uh, programmed in the CIP for 2025 design and 2026 construction, if approved through the county. Um, submitting the PPS to the county with our recommendations is just the first step of getting on the list. And uh, there's not too many people on that list right now, so it gives us a good opportunity to secure that funding for uh, to move this project forward in 2025 and 2026. Um, addresses a lot of issues through the corridor. Um, there's a lot of flooding risk right there. And this is just the project study, so nothing's been designed yet. It's just coming up with some solutions as we get into design. We'll get more in depth on what that actually looks like when we build it. Um, be happy to answer any questions or I can turn it over to Brad to kind of go through his presentation as well. Any questions before we move on to the presentation? Council Member Crane? Um, as you move forward, I'm so glad you gave us information on the bridges. As you move forward on the other bridges in Mission, could you keep us apprised of what the ratings are on at least the annual? Yeah, I was going to bring it back probably the first of the year. I just received it two days ago. So I just, I know those are, we've had also three failures in the last five years along that corridor. So it's, it's a ticking time bomb in some aspects. So uh, if it's just what we love. Mm. <laughs> so thank you. Councilmember Davis. Brent, I had a question on the Johnson County interceptor. Does that have to be cleaned out periodically at all, the interceptor itself? On Johnson Drive? Right. So we've never had to clean it, and we've had it inspected. I couldn't remember when BHC did our first inventory, and they sent cameras down it, and it was it was clean. I mean, there's always a little set of it, but no right. issues. So we've never had an issue with it like we did with the box culverts under right. Gateway since it's basically catching all the underground storm and it's not an open creek channel. So not saying it could never happen, you know, if that 30 inch water main blows across town and 
puts a bunch of mud down it, we might have to check it out. But we haven't had any issues, and I don't see any issues in the future, really, at this point. And I wanted to thank you for updating the re report. Yes. Uh, after I sent uh, an email, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a lengthy report, so it's it's very detailed, but I appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate Thank you. Councilmember Thomas. Hi. Hey. Thank you. Um, so I'm just ass assuming we chose project alternative three because four that was recommended is too costly. So yeah, we wanna, let's, do we want to maybe let the let's let Brad just for um, public okay. benefit do his okay. presentation and sure. then we'll come back because I think then we'll know what three we'll and four are when we're talking four, to everybody. And then we can kind of explain sure. this is a learning experience for all of us, including the folks at the county. Um, and maybe Brad can touch on that with a meeting that we had, a lengthy meeting that we had with them. I um, mean, just trying to figure out the new process and, and how that works. Thanks, Council Member Thomas. Sorry Thank to jump you. in on you. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Schleter. I'm with Olson, and uh, Olson completed the preliminary project study, as Brent said, for this stretch of Rock Creek between, essentially between Lamar and Knoll. Um, it's that area. And again, as, as the name implies, this is a preliminary study. So um, the point of it is to uh, identify what the risks are in terms of flooding and identify potential solutions, come up with costs for those solutions, and then ultimately uh, recommend a solution that gets moved forward for approval through the county uh, funded and then the project goes to design. So this is this you'll see in a minute as I get into this, it's at a pretty high level. Uh, we do look at some specific things that could be uh, kind of make or break, you know, if there's major utility impacts or uh, property impacts, we wanna know those now. So we get to that level of detail, but that's as far as it goes in terms of uh, detail. Um, so just a, a little bit of background, we'll go to the, the next slide. Brent mentioned some of this, but this is this is the map on your screen that the county has used with the move to this watershed based approach to stormwater management. So they split the county up into six watershed organizations. And the intent and the hope with this is that projects that in the past, as they've been funding projects since I think 1990 is when their stormwater management program came into being, they would really be uh, at the city level. So the cities would bring forward a project, uh, it would get scored um, and it would compete against all the other projects that other cities were submitting. The new approach uh, in theory, and again, we're right at the beginning, so we'll see how this actually works when the time comes. The projects are in theory, supposed to be brought forward from the watershed organization representatives, which are representative from every city that's in the watershed organization. Uh, the hope being that that can be kind of initial level of uh, vetting and prioritizing of projects so that the best projects get brought forward for funding and approval. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Uh, we're right at the beginning. Um, so this is one of the first projects that's being submitted as a preliminary project study. And we've worked through the, the, uh, the process as, as Laura mentioned, they just haven't gone through it often. So it's a, it's a bit new. Um, and yeah, I think the, the, one of the changes from the old approach to studies in flood studies was the solutions had to address all the flooding. So you had to, if there was flooding, you had a solution and had to address everything in order for it to be viable and considered. This process uh, that they've moved to, I, I think in an effort to try to capture uh, more critical projects, larger projects, um, projects that if the solution before was just way too costly and you could never do it, the project didn't move forward. So the criteria now is a risk 
reduction based criteria. So your project is graded and scored based on how much risk you reduce. And then you uh, you divide the, the, the cost estimate by that risk reduction number. And that's the score. Brent was mentioning this cost efficiency factor. That's essentially the score for the project. So I'll get into that in, in just a minute, but um, next slide. So this is the, this is a map from the stormwater, the, the master, the watershed master plan. Uh, this is risk focus area. So the, the master plan process looked at all the different risks within the whole county. And, and in this case, within watershed organization one, that's, that's where uh, mission is located. And so it looked at flooding risk and stream erosion risk water quality risk and hydro modification, which is the watershed, how the watershed's affected by development activities. That's what hydro modification means, um, how it how it responds and how you know water runs off from, from a watershed. So this is one of the areas that uh, there was enough risks collected in one particular area that uh, we just kind of went through the whole watershed organization boundary and circled areas where there was a collection of risks. So this was um, number two on the list of areas where there was a lot of potential risk. Um, I circled the the particular study area in, in red on that figure. Uh, we move to the next slide. So this is uh, maybe the next slide is is our actual study figure. So this is the figure that was developed. You can see the, the red dashed boundary is the kind of limits of our study. So um, it's, it's those risk focus area maps covered a bigger area. Um, our project is, is a bit more focused on this specific area of Rock Creek um, and addressing the risk within that area. The the, the process here to start this preliminary project study, um, we had to we had to do the analysis part first. So that's kind of the first step in the process. So we we did uh, we did have to update some modeling in order to have a usable analysis. So we there it was we were a little bit surprised at how complicated that ended up being. We had to recreate the hydrologic model, which is the how much runoff comes off the site. And we also had to update the hydraulic model, which is how that water that runs off moves through the creek channel. So we had to actually make updates to both of those because neither of them were um, up to date and usable. They were either old programs that aren't used anymore, or <clears throat> there were um, different pieces of models put together, but there was no comprehensive one. So anyways, that was our first step to uh, the analysis that was performed. You can see on this map, we identified that that shaded blue area is the inundation boundary from the existing 100 year storm event. Uh, we identified with the, the orange hatching buildings that flooded. So that was based on elevations now where we had the low floor elevations for the buildings and we had the hydraulic elevations from the creek channel and wherever the creek was above the, the building, we identified it as flooding. Uh, and then the stars are the roadways that are flooding. And that goes into uh, the, the risk calculation uh, that I was talking about earlier. The next slide, uh, this gets into so this is one of the figures uh, in the report that's kind of <clears throat> looks at all the, the main improvements that were done. Uh, but we did look at a whole host of things that could potentially reduce risk within this project area, uh, mainly centered around things that could be done in Rock Creek, because that was the, the focus of the study. But things like uh, upsizing the culverts and widening the channel and replacing the current channel with a <clears throat> with a with a, a, a vegetated slopes and kind of laid back slopes, um, realigning the channel, lowering it, 
um, extending that storm water interceptor in Johnson Drive. So right now it ends at Lamar, um, extending that further west. That was another thing that we looked at. <clears throat> and then uh, just looking a little bit bigger at the potential for upstream detention. So we looked at a lot of different things to see if they had any impact and if they really move the needle in terms of reduced risk. Um, the, the bottom line is this, this is the figure that kind of represents, at least in Rock Creek, the, the, the solutions that were selected to move forward to alternatives. So solutions or a group of solutions are put together and then that's called an alternative. So we did four alternatives with this project um, and they build on one another. So you'll kind of see that in the results. Uh, alternative one is the least effective and alternative four is the most effective. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So this is the, the Rock Creek alternative and things in, in doing in Rock Creek. And then the next slide shows uh, that again, a concept solution of what the extension of that Johnson Drive interceptor could look like. Uh, next slide, uh, we'll just go back to the Rock Creek solution. So <clears throat> just to try to set the stage for what the alternatives actually are, uh, the first alternative uh, included the uh, es essentially creating a, a uniform channel section. So right now that segment of Rock Creek has a lot of different sections from vertical walled channels to laid back slopes to riprap slopes to concrete. It's a lot of different things. Uh, so for our alternative number one, we looked at um, having a uniform channel section from uh, just downstream of Woodson to just downstream of Reeds Road. That's the kind of focus area for alternative number one. Uh, we did have uh, lowering of the channel in that area. It's a little hard to see on the figure, but the bottom of the figure is the profile of the channel. So we show the existing channel bottom, and then we show the, the proposed channel bottom, and it's about, uh, it varies a little bit, but between one and two feet lower um, through that section, downstream of Woodson to downstream of Reeds Road. And, uh, and then we also upsized the the culverts at Outlook and Reeds Road. So those are the components of alternative one. Uh, we look at alternative two and it's all of those same things plus the extension of the Johnson Drive interceptor. So that's, that's, that's added to it. The benefit of uh, extending the interceptor line, it, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, helping flow move through Rock Creek at all but it does divert a certain percentage of the flow that's getting to the creek now and sends it downstream. So we'll, we'll look in a minute when we get to another graph. The benefit of that is there's less flow on the upstream side of where you have all this flooding um, and that generally helps reduce water levels. Alternative three is the um, all of the same channel improvements that I talked about for alternative one plus also upsizing the culvert at Woodson and lowering that culvert. So you can see how these alternatives kind of build on one another. And then alternative four is everything that's in alternative three plus the extension of Johnson Drive Interceptor. So those are the four alternatives. Uh, the, I think you have a copy of the plan there. Um, it discusses them in much greater detail and you can look into the, the specifics of it, but that's a real high level overview of the four different alternatives. Uh, I've got a couple slides here that show some results. So these are figures from the report again. Uh, this one's got a lot of colors in it um, and there's a lot going on on this figure. I think our hope was to show it overlaid over one another just to give you a sense of, again, the, the alternative one has the least amount of risk reduction benefit and alternative four has the most amount of risk reduction benefit. And that's reflected in this, uh, in the next two slides, this one is the flood inundation limits. So there's that blue boundary, that's the existing condition. And then we work towards the, uh, the purple shade is alternative one limits. So you can see that blue blob goes to something smaller. Um, alternative two is the, the, the reddish shaded. 
Uh, and then there's like a brownish color for alternative three. Uh, and then lastly, the, the blue shade, the blue boundary is alternative four. So it, it's particularly noted on, on Woodson. You can see those, those shapes reduce in size as you go from alternative one down to alternative four. Um, so that's a, that's representative of what's going on in the different alternatives. <clears throat> Um, I actually, if you click it twice, I have a little arrows there. <laughs> There's some little arrows for you. Uh, the next slide is looking at it just in a different way. There's a lot of lines on this map too. So I, um, if you're not familiar with looking at uh, a, a kind of graph of profiles, it just looks like a bunch of lines. Um, so I'll point out a couple things. Uh, we'll click... Uh, once in, in the second time. So those arrows are pointing to that uh, channel bottom. So the, the dash light blue line is the existing channel bottom. Uh, that all alternatives arrow there is pointing to that section of the channel that's downstream of Woodson to downstream of Reeds Road. Uh, and you can see we're lowering the channel about two feet in that area. Uh, and then that second arrow is pointing as I mentioned, to the Woodson culvert uh, also being lowered. So it's just representative of how we're actually lowering the channel bottom in a profile view. Um, if you click on the next, click two more times. Um, mm -hmm. As I was saying with the, the Johnson Drive interceptor, the benefit of that is it takes flow from upstream and routes it to the downstream side of our project. The result of that is a lowered flood profile. So the two alternatives that don't include the, the extension of that interceptor, the profile is a bit higher. So that's the, the light blue line that's on top and it's labeled alternatives one and three. With the extension of the interceptor, we redirect uh, a portion of the flow so that water surface elevation goes down. And that's the, the, the dark blue line on that figure. So happy to go into much more detail on that, but I figured I would just kind of hit it at a high level. I think the bottom line, if you hit one more time, the bottom line is, this is a good example. This is right in the middle of uh, that north-south section of the creek. We're showing a reduction in that 100-year water surface of five to six feet. That is, that's pretty substantial. Um, so all of the alternatives aside, that's the the main take home message here is it's a really significant change uh, because we're providing that additional capacity in the channel. It takes the flow from outside the channel and puts it into the channel, and that's what we want. the The last main slide here. So this is these are just some little summary uh, tables of that risk calculation, like I mentioned, and the cost. So they're, they're ordered, uh, one is, is top left, two is bottom left, three is top right, four is bottom right. Um, the main numbers, again, with this information is the change in risk number. So that goes from a change in risk for alternative one of 0 0.8 to 1.6 for alternative two, the 2.0 for alternative three, and then 2.3 for alternative four. And there's a giant spreadsheet that spits out that one number. So it's got all sorts of different inputs with elevations and water surfaces and uh, streets flooding and all sorts of different things. And it spits out the, the change in risk number. So the higher the change in risk, the more effective the project is. Uh, but then you have to take the project cost and you divide it by that change in risk. So it, they kind of work together where if you have a project that reduces a lot of risk, but it's really expensive, that cost efficiency factor is still going to be pretty high. If you have a project that doesn't cost very much, but the change in risk is really low, you're not going to have a very good cost efficiency factor either. So just comparing those, you can see like alternative one, for example, the efficiency factor is actually more than the cost because that change in risk is less than one. Um, 
while alternative four has the most change in risk, it also has the highest cost. So just comparing all the alternatives, alternative three is actually the one that has the least, uh, the lowest cost efficiency factor. Um, you don't have to recommend or select the alternative that has the lowest cost efficiency factor. Uh, but I think when, when we were going through this with uh, with staff just looking at the benefit that's provided for the dollars that would be spent between alternatives three and four, it seemed like alternative three was the the best option to get the most risk reduced at the lowest cost. And that's reflected in that cost efficiency factor being the lowest of the four alternatives. So I'm not, I think I'll end there. Um, if, if there are questions, I'd be happy to take those now. Let me just add a couple of things from a lay person's perspective, because I've had a lot more time to digest some of this than um, than you all have. So I think it, originally the study that was in the packet recommended alternative four. I think part of the, and we've learned some things. We went and sat down and met with the county staff once we had this PPS and kind of walked them through. Is, is the methodology you proposed, is this generating the results that you think you saw? Because I think the intent would be you go, you recommend the project with the highest um, risk reduction score, right? We were trying to figure out what's that balance between how are, how's the county going to evaluate the risk reduction score and the cost efficiency factor and marrying up what they think they would fund. And I think what, what we heard them tell us was, yeah, I think it's working kind of like we thought, but it would be a hard sell for us to fund fully alternative four for a variety of reasons. And so they think that's where we just kind of had the disconnect of not going back and, and switching that that alternative out. The interceptor, I know, for Council Member Crane probably is the only one who will remember conversations about that. It's been a long time, um, even prior to the interceptor that was put in on the first phase of the Johnson Drive improvements. And so we've always sort of been holding that in, in the back of our minds as we looked at the next uh phase of Johnson Drive improvements from Lamar West to Metcalf um, and really evaluating with the other improvements that we've made, uh, whether that was a good investment. It would be a significant cost as a part of that road reconstruction project. And I think uh, this really helped to prove to us that, uh, and the county, I think, validated this in that I think they had actually some hydro modification concerns about the interceptor when we sat down with the meeting about they felt maybe it was more appropriate to just let water get to the creek channel in that section the way that it naturally does. We're not certainly not running at capacity in the existing section of the interceptor. Um, but really, if I recall, and I don't think your map showed this, but I think the difference, you took one house out of a floodplain with the interceptor um, or the cost differential, there are probably other ways to address that. So some of those were all the factors in, but this also helps us then as we move forward and then in 2024 with design of that next phase of Johnson Drive, we've checked that box, we can answer that interceptor question and kind of move forward uh, from there. So a lot of information to digest. The other thing that I would say is that we have uh, met um, with the consultants for the Planning Sustainable Places Grant along this Rock Creek corridor. Uh, and talked through kind of those alternatives and understanding, really exploring some things with them, but really understanding the limits. And so I think um, we've we've all had some great conversations about how these will fit together and that we want to still improve that section uh, aesthetically. Um, and that some of those things, I think the timing of that, while initially it felt a little um, bumpy, I think will work out well because we now know the limits of kind of the channel as they move forward and recommend specific implementation projects for that stretch. Councilmember Curry. Being on the council for quite a while, some of the stormwater activities and anything with water transmission, water transference underground is hard to sell to a lot of people because they don't see it. They don't understand the whole concept of what happens with the floodplain, we went through that when we purchased all the properties along John's. It was um, kind of a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, so how we market whatever determination is made based on cost analysis and and scientific exposure, et cetera, we really need to know how to 
make sure that the public at large understands what's going on, because I think that will be a benefit to whatever choice we make. Councilmember Thomas. To Debbie's point, I, you know, I know we're not to the design phase, but just a, a note for the design phase, I'd, I'd love to see us find a way to better engage that, you know, particular section of channel for pedestrians, maybe it's a bridge or two, or, you know, I think about the village shop section of, of their, you know, creek that's running through. And again, I know it's just a section of a lot of very piecemealed creek, um, but whatever we could do to make that greener and more walkable potentially would be fabulous for when we get to the design phase. Anyone else questions, comments? Yeah, Council Member Loudon. Just to kind of jump off of, of what, what uh, Council Member Thomas was saying, look more natural, I think would be nice because, you know, it looks very like a, you know, man-made well, and it, and it will look like a man-made. If you think about just the constraints and the parking lots for the apartments, particularly on the south side that come right up, you know, almost to the edge of the creek. And if you think about the creek failures, the channel failures and slope failures that we've had and we've put, I, I don't know, Brent, what have we spent? $750,000? It, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, to, you know, to kind of repair those, knowing that those would be sort of temporary fixes. So I think part of the conversations that we've had with planning sustainable places consultants is how do we <clears throat> recognizing that we're still going to have sort of this engineered more hard solution to to get the water through that section of downtown but if we think about how unattractive perhaps the outlook parking uh, you know Emily's favorite outlook parking lots and some of those other and so how can we put you know, how can we green those areas surrounding that creek? Um, it, it may not be a creek that's that the public can interact with through that section, um, but certainly there are a lot of things that we can do to address, I think, water quality, water retention, green infrastructure, and really make that whole section more aesthetically pleasing. I'll so. just add, we, we had an open house last Thursday night for the PSP study. All the boards are outside in the lobby, so you're more than welcome during intermission or afterwards to go out and look at those, and you can ask me any questions. But it talks to all of that, kind of greening the area along the Rock Creek Corridor and landscaping and public amenities, and et cetera. Mayor Flora. Yeah, just to that point, I was wondering if you could give us like the 60-second version of green infrastructure and why that would not work you know, with the constraints that Laura mentioned, because I think that did come up in our planning sustainable places conversations. And, you know, people wonder why can't you just open the channel and let it flow and sort of the problems that that would cause in that area. I, I mean, I would say that um, the, the main function of this section of channel is conveyance. And so whatever you do, it has to be able to convey. Otherwise, you're not going to address the, really the root problem, which is the flooding. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't also do other things, but channel capacity is the main driver for lowering that water surface. Um, the, the challenge with opening up the channel and laying back the sides is the impacts to potential redevelopment, all the other things that are uh, potentially slated for that corridor and existing the, properties too right yep, existing uh, it's all it all you know you have to it's it's rather deep so in order to lay back the slopes and make them uh maintainable it ends up being fairly wide and it takes up a, a wide section through that kind of meandering uh stretch of the channel uh so there's sure there's some level of benefit um, in doing that, I would say the the in the larger picture, the the water quality benefit of just having this very short section of vegetated channel is pretty minimal in terms of a water quality benefit. And if you're going to spend money on green infrastructure, uh, it's it's better suited for really small scale applications that have very small drainage areas, and you're able to capture that water put it in contact with vegetation at a really small scale. Um, it's generally most effective in that instance. 
where you don't have the space to be able to some, do something that's that's much larger. Council Member Loudon. I just had one more question. You mentioned a couple of times um, lowering by a couple of feet. Tell me more about that. How does that benefit? And you know. the the benefit there is you uh, you're you're adding to the capacity, so you're you're taking the the existing channel and lowering the bottom. So if this you know the sides stay the same, you're adding that additional depth on the bottom um, so it just adds to the capacity the 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 limitation there is uh, we do have bedrock in the southern part of the channel so there's um, that there is that reality the lowering primary lowering is is uh, upstream of of outlook so west of outlook um, and that's right around where that bedrock transition is so we're, we have some soil borings and we've identified where the rock is, uh, where we're lowering is just above where that rock layer is. Um, yeah, you might've had another part to the question, but I think that was. Wider or deeper gets more capacity. Yep, right. That counts Mover Thomas. Last thought, I promise. Um, at the Sustainability Commission meeting on I don't know, Monday, this Monday, last Monday? Okay, <laughs> the weeks. Um, it, the group brought up, again, the, the idea of a sustainability lens. And I think a project like this um, is a great, a great opportunity for us to think about what a sustainability could lens could mean when we get to the design phase. If you know we get approved, we get to that point, thinking about a way that we could capture just in a short little, just a little paragraph of you know how this investment is really a green investment, is really a climate centric investment in in our city, and it's just a way to outwardly reflect to the community. Um, the type of investments that we're exploring and potentially making. So just throwing that out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my first takeaway. What I like about it is we can't build anything on these parcels when they're in the floodplain. So density goes out the window. <laughs> Any other, uh, Council Member Davis? I just recommend that we take this to council non-consent. Okay, and to be clear, it's, uh, the question is submitting option three to the county stormwater program. Everybody okay? Well, I guess non-consent. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Okay, our next action item tonight is consideration of remodeling the North Bathrooms at the Powell Community Center with Penn Albany. Hey, Penn. Hello. You've been very patient. Thank Mayor you. Council. So uh, the Powell Community Center, two North Bathrooms are over by room C, D, and E. Originally installed in 2004 as part of the Community Center expansion. A lot of use. A lot of wear and tear, and uh, floor counters and dividers need replaced. We recently did replace all of the uh, the touchless fixtures during the pandemic, so those are relatively new. Um, restrooms are widely recognized as adding value to the facility, and uh, these would pose the, the greatest impact on uh, adding some opportunities for us to invest and uh, They've obviously, after 19 plus years, have some deferred maintenance considerations. So as staff progressed through this final phase of deferred maintenance, we uh, decided to highlight some of the elements that were most important, maintenance, um, aesthetic value, whatever uh, value it brings to the community center. And we uh, considered that as part of some of the... Um, remodeling elements. So these changes, changes coupled with um, our strong brand identity, we feel can hopefully continue to drive the interest in those rental spaces as well as some of our programming in the future. This project was approved as part of the 2023 capital improvement plan for 35,000. And um, it proposes a metallic epoxy flooring which if you look online, looks like a kind of a, a marble dish epoxy. So different than the locker room epoxy that's been installed to be a little bit higher element. Um, stone countertops, 
higher density polymer dividers and industrial hinges. And like I'd mentioned earlier, we, we'd wanna keep the sinks, toilets and touchless fixtures in place to save on costs. So we solicited 10 different contractors, two of whom were responsive, King's Collective for 61,200 and Mac General Contracting for $35,026. The nice thing about Mac General Contracting um, who we feel submitted the lowest and most responsive bid is they've worked on other community centers, the most recent being Matt Ross several years ago. So um, they can complete the project within a three week window. And keep in mind, this is both the men's room and the women's room right there on the North expansion. Staff recommends the project be awarded to Mac General Contracting for demolition and remodel of the two bathrooms in an amount not to exceed $35,026 with anticipated installation to occur during spring break, which would be March of 2024. And once again, those funds would be, were approved as part of the 2023 CIP and would be provided by Parks and Recreation Sales Tax. I'm happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Crane. Timing-wise, spring break, everybody's out and at the community center. Is that the only option we have? For it's, it's interesting you say that because yes, they are out of school and yes, there is some impacts we've seen, but relative to other days, our attendance is lower. And so comparable to, you know, proximity to how quickly we want to get this done, we've we discussed internally whether it made sense to roll that into our August closure. The, uh, the downside of that would be we're extended beyond that window. And anytime we've done that in the past, patrons have, have felt like we weren't responding um, and utilizing that time as best as we possibly could. So it's, it's really a balance of how quickly could we get this done? That's a smaller rental window for us where we, we're not seeing the rental use numbers that we do. And most of our fitness use comes on the south side with the basketball courts during that spring break. Thank you. You bet. Councilmember Davis. Recommend we take this to council on consent. Okay. Thanks, Penn. Let's see. Oh, uh, yep, you're up again. Our next action item tonight, consideration of a steam sauna retiling at the community center. Thank you. So uh, the steam sauna was originally installed as part of the original floor layout in the natatorium. So uh, that's been in place since 1999. It's gotten good use, consistently gets good use, and it's one of our uh, it, durable areas in the natatorium. So it's we've got this steam uh, function in there, keeps it nice and warm for patrons who want to sweat off a few pounds. Um, compared to the the cedar, the dry air sauna, the hot tub, and then all of the other pumps, um, this this has the most open and consistent usage. So I'm happy to say it's gotten well used. The tiles show it, the grout lines show it. We did replace the grout lines this past year and to, to just minimize some of the sharp edges from tiling. And unfortunately, it, an inch by an inch um, square tiles, they just get exposed relatively quickly. So it's time to switch them out. Uh, we considered, obviously, visual aesthetics, safety, maintenance of ease, those types of efficiencies, and um, considered that from, we reached out to seven qualified vendors, four of whom responded to the bid. And the lowest and most responsive bid was from Alex Tile and Floor who has performed this function both in residential as well as commercial areas. And uh, during his walkthrough, he said he doesn't foresee any issues beyond what he bid on, which was $8,960. But as a buffer, in case there are damaged wall studs or there's ceiling issues that he notices or maybe a crack in the concrete that needs to be leveled out, um, he asked that we add $4,000 in there as a buffer that would only get spent or utilized if the need arises. And so uh, he can complete the project in six days. We anticipate this happening during a quick January closure over the course of a uh, weekend. And um, staff recommends the project be awarded to Alex Tile and Floor the steam sauna demolition and tile installation for a total not to exceed $12,960.
and funds are available through the Parks and Recreation Sales Tax Fund. Happy to answer questions. Councilmember Davis, oh, are you gonna raise your hand? Okay, go ahead, Councilmember Davis. Recommend take it to council and consent. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Penn. Yes. Before we get to the last item, could we find out, do you guys need anything signed? Okay, just checking, thanks. Okay, our final action item tonight, consideration of a CARS agreement for the Row Avenue uh, from Johnson Drive to 63rd Street 2024 CARS project. Hi again, Brent. Yep, thank you very much. Um, so like Ben said, this is our 2024 CARS project. Um, it's Row, Row Avenue between Johnson Drive and 63rd Street. Um, it's a rehabilitation project, kind of like Johnson Drive and Lamar we did. So it's a U-Bash treatment, which is a thin asphalt treatment spot curb and gutter replacement, um, addition of sidewalk on the east side of row, getting them up to Johnson Drive and crossing there. Uh, new traffic signal, right now that's owned by Evergy, so buying that one out, replacing it with an updated signal with uh, all the bells and whistles for pedestrian crossings. Um, and then permanent pavement markings and also corrugated metal pipe. So the county has a funding system for uh, Anything rated 3.5 or higher, um, they will help out those replacement costs. So uh, all the CMP along that corridor that has been inspected um, and is at that rating will be get replaced with this project. It's not a full overhaul, so it's not you know you're not going to tear up all the stormwater just with a project this size. But um, getting everything that's rated bad that could be a potential problem uh, is coming out of the ground and getting replaced with concrete pipe. The interlocal agreement just specifies the county's participation in the project. Um, at 870,000, that's based off the engineer's estimate in 2023 at 1.8 million. Um, it's a 50% cost share. Uh, I know last year on our Fox Ridge project, we don't t always get that 50% cost share uh, the way the CARS program works. But since this is multi-cities participating in this project, we've got Fairway, Prairie Village, and Roland Park. Um, we're able to hit that 50% mark and uh, everybody's paying their piece of this project um city missions administrating the project um, we will just get reimbursed from those other cities as the invoices come in uh projects is about 80 to 90 percent at this point it's in kdot's hands for review just for the signal and some of the right away that this project uh, impacts is within kdot's jurisdiction so uh, it shouldn't be a long process uh, they just need to give us an approval to work in that area um, once that takes place and the other cities review the final plans, we can hopefully get this project out to bid first of the year to get a good price and hopefully in March get going on the row project. Be happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments? I did I did have one I want to mention on on behalf of some constituents and some discussion that we've had that it would I, I agree with a, an email thread that I had with Josh Thede about how it would be really, really uh Nice isn't even a strong enough word, I think, to get that sidewalk portion along the gateway parcel taken care of here. But um, I've, I've heard the staff concerns on that, and I don't, I just don't think it's it's workable in this particular project. With with what you mentioned to me earlier today, Laura, that you know we would not let this languish for another. I don't want to talk about how long necessarily, um, without putting a sidewalk in there. I, I understand that we need to. Um, just for practical reasons, move forward with what we, what we've got on the table now. So, uh, but I, I did want to yeah, mention that I, I agree clear. that that's a pretty important. Yeah, it is, piece. and it's identified in the bike pad plan, and I think on the previous uh, iteration of the gateway project, the, the intent is for sidewalks to be on both sides of row through that section. Um, so it's just do do we spend our dollars now to potentially come back and have it torn out, you know, later? So, but again, not wanting it to sit for an extended period of time. Thank you. That was just a comment that I, I wanted to bring up on behalf of some constituents. I recommend that we take this to council on non-consent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes the action items and we have no discussion items this evening. Uh, Ms. Smith, are there department updates for community development? I don't know, but I think in the interest of time, let's move into finance and admin. And if any of my uh, colleagues have things they want to share when we get to the end of that meeting, we'll let them do that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, 
Okay. With that said, it's now 8, 11 p.m. With no further discussion, that concludes the meeting of the Community Development Committee. Do we have video tonight? Is the recording still working? Okay, great. This video will be made public on our website at missionks.org. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm actually going to head out. I'm not feeling all that well. Either. All right. It is now 8, 12 p.m. and I'd like to call the meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee to order. While this meeting is being held in person, we are also offering the option for the public to participate through Zoom if preferred. Instructions on how to attend virtually are included in the City Council calendar item listed on the front page of missionks.org. The public is also invited to participate in the meeting. If you are participating through Zoom, please either add your comment in the chat feature and it will be read out loud or note that you would like to speak and we will call on you shortly to make your comment verbally. Please remember your comments or questions are visible to everyone in the meeting. If you are part of our in-person group tonight, please raise your hand, but stay seated and we will call on you to go to the lectern to make your comment. When you make your comment, please state your name and city of residence for the record. Also, please be conscientious of others trying to speak and speak slowly and clearly. This meeting will be recorded and posted on the city's website at missionks.org. Please call the administration offices at 913-676-8350 with any questions or concerns. Ms. Folks, please call the roll. Thomas? Here. Loudon? Here. Ryard? Here. Pring? Here. Bolting House is here, but here. stepped out for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our first item of business is public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to comment now? Seeing none, um, we have no public presentations this evening. Therefore, we will now proceed with our regular agenda. Our first action item this evening is the acceptance of the meeting minutes from Robin Folks. Thank you. Draft minutes of the November Finance and Administration Committee meeting minutes are included for review and acceptance in your packet tonight. Okay. Thank you. Any other, any comments on that? No, oh, okay. Our second action, oh, sorry, recommendation nine. Oh yeah, yeah We're... let's let's accept them. Okay, yeah. great. Yes, yes, yes. Con yeah. consent. Our second action item is consideration of 2024 legislative priorities from Laura Smith. Yes, thank you. So we had a work session on November 29th uh, with Stuart Little of Little Government Relations uh, to kind of review a draft program. Uh, what you uh, see reflected in your packet this evening um, were the changes that we discussed, some additions, some sort of modifications to align with um, issues that they believe will probably see the most uh, movement or discussion in this upcoming legislative mm -hmm. session. Uh, just as a couple of highlights, um, we changed some of the things on tax and appraisal policy. Uh, we removed some of the references to dark store theory, although reserving the right uh, to certainly, uh, if that issue surfaces this session or uh, again in the future, uh, we sort of know we want to take a position in, in opposition to that. Um, we added uh, or sort of pulled from the league's statement of municipal policy uh, a statement about abandoned and blighted properties um, and preserving our ability or in expanding our ability to really deal with those properties. Uh, again, housing and rental inspections, we sort of added back in. Uh, we addressed the education financing piece to more closely align with um, the uh, Shawnee Mission School District's position as it relates to special education funding and um, sort of an anti-voucher uh, approach. So that was modified. Uh, we pulled out um, in the infrastructure section, uh, we had included sort of a statement about multimodal transportation and Vision Zero. Uh, it was combined with another um, sort of issue or point. Uh, we just pulled that out and made it a standalone point uh, to highlight that a little bit more. Um, and then we changed the uh, language um, from marijuana to cannabis under uh, the miscellaneous section to more closely align with the language that's included in the bills and the legislation that has been introduced. Um, and I know uh, it, it was interesting. I think uh, Stuart thought he that might not see much traction. Um, I was at the chamber's legislative breakfast last week, and some of our representatives think perhaps there's some momentum building around or maybe more action on that this legislative session than originally anticipated. So happy to answer any other questions 
uh, but this is presented for your consideration. If adopted next week, we would then send that off uh, to our legislators and have it available for uh, the league's uh, local government days uh, and or any other discussion. And then we would expect once the session uh, starts up, um, we'll have the weekly updates from LGR that are that are distributed. Any questions about staff? Um, didn't we also change or strengthen uh, conversations about affordable housing? Yes, I'm sorry, we did. Anybody else? Great, uh, yes, recommendation. Recommend we take this to council non-consent. Our next action item tonight for is for consideration of classification and compensation recommendations also from Laura Smith. Yes, thank you. So um, typically at the end of the year, uh, we try to go back and do a review of our overall classification compensation structure and make any recommendations uh, as we head into the next year. I think everyone's aware that the challenge to recruit and retain uh, employees has become increasingly competitive. Uh, we expect it to stay that way for the foreseeable foreseeable future, but we've been very fortunate that you will have really consistently demonstrated a willingness to make that a high priority um, and making significant investments over the last several years in both classification and compensation adjustments. Uh, you've done that through uh, the, the major study and the implementation of the class comp study in 2017, a pretty significant update in 2021. We've done wage uh, adjustments for part-time staff uh, at the community center, which has helped with our uh, certainly recruitment and retention. And then um, we had an adjustment earlier this year for the police department specifically. And then the we've tried to manage and make uh, merit pools that were significant enough uh, to sort of keep pace um, with all of those things as well. This has really allowed us, I think, to remain competitive um, and has really been appreciated uh, by the employees. Um, as we move into 2024, we're recommending some changes which uh, impact the overall salary structure. We haven't adjusted our salary ranges in total um, really since I believe September of 2021. Our ranges are extremely wide from minimum to maximum. So there's a lot of room for growth and movement within the existing salary ranges. Uh, but I think it's appropriate now to look at that one and a half percent adjustment of the entire salary structure. It has no immediate uh, financial impact um, because folks are within those existing ranges. Uh, and we don't think that that creates, we looked at that and evaluated the potential for compression issues and the need to make any adjustments. And we think one and a half is a good, is a good starting point. Then we always look at uh, several other, other reclassifications that have been brought forward from various departments this year, uh, looking to reclassify the part-time administrative assistance position in the public works department. Um, it's already a benefits eligible position. Uh, so the uh, financial impact is limited to the addition of 10 hours a week uh, versus 30 hours a week now. I think the memo included in your packet talked about some of the changes that we've made, increasing the responsibilities, uh, supporting the director and the superintendent in terms of right of way inspections and, and kind of expanding that role uh, beyond some of the things the previous uh, position was doing. Uh, reclassification of the parks maintenance supervisor to a grade 16. Uh, when we added the supervisory responsibility to that, we handled that salary adjustment internally and now we just need to allocate um, that position in the appropriate salary grade. So it has no immediate financial impact. Um, assignment of the business manager or superintendent's position, which is a new position that was recommended coming out of the feasibility study um, to a grade 23. Uh, previously, we'd had an administrative supervisor's position classified at a grade 20, but with the additional responsibilities um, being assigned to the business manager, specifically sort of the collection and analysis of data uh, we felt that reclassification was appropriate. That position is vacant currently. We are recruiting for it. Um, reclassification of the aquatics facility manager's position from a grade 17 to a grade 20. Uh, and this is really just reflective of a lot of the certifications um, that are required to manage 
not just the staff at the pool, but the actual mechanical systems um, of the pool. And it keeps that aquatic facilities manager position in line with the program supervisor uh, and the facility supervisor position. And then um, reclassification of a part-time accounting position in parks and recreation to take it from about 20 hours a week to 30 hours a week, which would make it um, also benefits eligible. That's the one that had the most significant immediate financial impact. Um, but that position we envision uh, is already a tremendous support, not only to the Parks and Recreation Department, but to finance admin and administration in terms of reconciling the revenues <laughs> that are coming in, in particular, uh, between rentals and memberships. Uh, there's a lot of, and I can see Brian's head nodding, we've both had to work through audits. Um, so having that that piece uh, clearly connected um, is really important. And then as we add and layer on some of the things that we anticipate as we move uh, through some of the business models that we've discussed with the feasibility study, uh, we think that the opportunities to take advantage of time in that position will benefit in a variety of ways. So happy to answer any questions. Do we have a rough estimate over the year of how many lapsed hours we have from people, uh, lapsed FTE hours like Celia or anything like that where they were? We don't know. We don't track, we don't formally track the number of hours that are lapsed. I mean, we look at it from uh, the perspective each year we, because we budget for full FTEs. And so then there's a variety of factors that come into play each year, but we don't have a formal mechanism where we look at that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I just want to say we support the continued refreshing of this and I like the fact that we're trying to be remain competitive in the marketplace. So with that, I would recommend that we take this to council, uh, non-consent. Um, our fourth action item tonight is for consideration of carrot renewal from Emily Reynolds. Hello, thank you. As you know, the city is a member of CARIT, Kansas Eastern Regional Insurance Trust, and um, it's a workers' compensation pool for local governments, and we are one of 18 members. Um, we have renewal for you with great news. Um, we've been waiting for some high claims years to fall off of our three-year average, and that day has come. And so um, we are proposing... Um, the um well and we describe the way that that is factored in but we've been watching that and working with them um our our overall size of payroll and the claims we've experienced um in the past impact our pricing and so this year's re renewal has come through at $87,263 down from $133,195 or one $133,195 so um it's great news we um are going to be zeroing in, monitoring that always, but zeroing in our budgeting for future years. So we're hitting the target a little more accurately for, we knew this was coming. We just didn't reflect it quite in the budgeting, but um, we can um, see that trend. And and we've been, as you know, working really well on our um, loss control efforts here in the city with just awareness and training and ongoing emphasis on that and in our daily work. Um, and um, so we hope to continue this trend. Thank you, Emily. Great news. Thank you. Any comments, questions? Ben? If there are no questions, we'll take this to consent. Yep. And our fifth action item tonight is for consideration of property and casualty and general liability insurance renewals, also from Emily. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as we reach the end of the year, it's time again to um, renew all of the things. And that is, um, also includes our property casualty, casualty and general liability insurance renewals. Um, I did want to point out we have Tom McGuire from CBiz here. We thank him for his presence tonight, but also um, his he and his team and their support with us getting to this point. Um, they are a third party broker that help us look at all of the angles and um, evaluate our um, our options in these programs and their premiums. Um, the news is not positive here. Um, as Tom and his team have explained to us, and as Brian has explained to us in past years, 
Um, this is a very, very limited market for a customer of our, our user of our size and in the public market space, public uh, sector space. So our, the carriers, just as you know, I mean, you hear about it even in the news that the um, natural disasters and nationwide trends are impacting us here and um, our options are fewer and fewer. That may or may not be cyclical. Um, we hope that maybe there are some alternatives on the horizon as um, these trends continue, but um, in general, we'll just need to shift the um, budget emphasis to protect us against these kinds of increases for now. Um, we have the renewal coming through, uh, maintaining coverage as we've had it before, um, uh, with the same types of plans that were detailed in your packet uh, for a uh, total annual premium not to exceed $235,276, which does represent an increase of 33% over our 2023 premiums. That, I should say, increase is um, covered by the budget we did anticipate for this line item at an increase, as well as the savings we see in the workers' compensation premium renewal. Okay. Do we have any questions, comments? Recommendation, yes. Recommend we take this to council on consent. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Our next action item tonight is for consideration of a contract renewal with DTI from Brian Scott. Thank you. I also come bearing bad news. Here it is. Um, so we have had an ongoing interlocal agreement with um, Johnson County's Department of Information and Technology, DTI, since 2011 for, for network support. So we... Um, we have a city network here. We have um, a network data closet upstairs in the police department. And we have laptops that attach through wires and Wi-Fi to that network. And then the folks from DTI support that network for us. So they have access to it. They're backing it up every night. Um, they're providing the internet service to the outside world. Um, anytime we have any issues with either the server or laptops they provide a help desk which we call and get the support that we need and um I, you know there's been some hiccups over the years yeah the police department and the uh, city hall have had some issues but i think we've kind of worked to try to resolve those issues and i think at least from our standpoint city hall the service has probably been a lot better in the last few years um but they have kind of gone through this past year and sort of reevaluated the cost for providing those services and their goal is to try to realize as close as they can to complete cost recovery. So with that said, um, we saw a substantial increase in our in our cost for 2024 of about 33%. So uh, we've traditionally been paying total between the police department and city hall in the 60s, and we've been seeing about an 8% increase for the past several years. Um, but what they're proposing for 2024 is um, the cost of $93,000, which, as I said, would be a 33% increase. And um, they have also developed a new IT master services agreement, which is something that we have been kind of, um, I won't say harping, but we've been requesting for the last several years to more clearly identify what are their responsibilities? What are our responsibilities in a particular response time? So if we call you with an issue, when can we expect a response and escalation if we don't get an adequate response to solve the issue? So they provided that in this master services agreement, um, which I think was a, a pretty good first attempt or some kind of reading through this. I did have some questions at the last minute I brought to their attention. I suggest we should probably revisit this again early in 2024 to fine tune it, but this is good for now. So, so with that, I will answer any questions you may have. Yeah, Debbie, just a quick comment. When Dave Malloy was on the police force and was trying to do all the IT work and his police work, I had to look at what his salary was and how much time he was spending on this with 
limited resources from us to give him what he needed to do that and his other work. Yeah. So when I look at that and look at, you know, we don't have to worry about anything internally and somebody being taken off their job and calling in somebody else, this, I still support this. Yeah. And those were the old days. You had somebody that you just kind of found in the organization, has some computer knowledge, and they were just kind of, you know, handle as best they could. Running a network, especially with cybersecurity issues, has become so complicated now. And you have to find folks with specific certifications and certain trainings and expertise in certain areas of network operations, which has been a challenge for every organization, including DTI. And it's a little bit of the driver behind the increase. It's like everybody else, we're seeing staff turnover. And so they're trying to attract qualified candidates for those jobs, which means having to elevate the salaries. So that is a little bit of the reason for this. And I should add, too, that I have had conversations over the last few years with private firms. We've just been kind of shopping around a little bit. And typically the cost they give me is about $100,000 to support the police and city hall. And when I start to kind of probe them a little bit about that as well, we provide, you know, network support. You know, we have an operation in a cave somewhere. So we got servers to back up what you guys are doing. And we have a help desk and that's it. They don't ever provide anybody to come on site and set up that new server in Iraq, you know, or unbox the laptops that come in and set all those up at desks, which is something that DTI has always been doing for us at no cost. So I can't really argue with the cost too much when they say they want to increase it to 93,000. So. Yep. Recommend we take this to consent. Thank you. Um, our next action item tonight is for consideration of replacement of the city's network equipment, also from Brian. Okay, that's me again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, same song, different tune or different verse. Um, we had budgeted for 2023 the replacement of several network components. Um, we were primarily looking at switches for our network. And those are the devices that attach individual laptops to the server, you know, little things that sit in the rack upstairs. But um, further examining that need with DTI, we really need to replace our servers. So we have two servers, one for the police department, one for city hall that were purchased in 2017. And they really reached the end of their useful life. We've started having problems with our city hall server in the last few months where it's going down. It's about every day and we're having to call them and have it rebooted. So it's really kind of slowing things down for us. So we solicited uh, quotes from three firms for uh, two Dell PowerEdge R750 servers. And the lowest quote was provided by Technology Group Solutions here in Kansas City, TGS, for $25,670 for a new, two new servers. Uh, we did get a slightly lower um, quote from Summit uh, group out of uh, Minneapolis, but that was for a rebuild server. I figured for the difference in price, let's just get new and get the full warranty and it's fresh out of the box. Um, we also have Wi-Fi access points. Some of you kind of complained about being able to get onto the Wi-Fi. That's, that's the issue. These things are really old. And so uh, we put a request in for 11 Cisco Catalyst 91641 access points. Those are the latest and greatest in the market. And again, TGS provided the low quote for 17636 And then finally, um, something else I've been kind of harping on DTI a little bit about is multi-factor authentication licenses. So they um, have been exploring the implementation of multi-factor authentication across the network. And they've been using um, Cisco Duo. So we're still experimenting with that, but what they like to do for us at least are those folks that are kind of remote users, people that work from home like Laura, myself, and Dan, and Robin, um, Emily. Um, what we're doing right now is we're accessing the network through a VPN or virtual private network, and that's kind of old school. So they like to go to an MFA of, by Cisco Duo, and they like for us to purchase 20 licenses for that purpose 
purpose with a three-year license, which would be $1,939. So eventually that works out. We'll rule that out to the entire organization. That would require that every employee that comes in the morning has to look at their iPhone or their Android phone and they log into the computer. But this is kind of the first step towards that. And that will help a lot with the cybersecurity issues. So that's a pretty much every cybersecurity insurance liability carrier is asking that we have MFA on our network. So, and two UPSs for 6,138. UPSs are uninterruptible power supplies. And this is what kind of keeps the network going when the power goes down until we can safely turn it off. So the grand total of 51,564. And we actually budget 97,000. So there's a little bit of savings there. Questions, comments? Tim? Recommend that we take this to consent. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just one Tony. comment. I sure. just took the security awareness training <clears throat> online today, and everything Brian said is so true. That was an excellent training opportunity. I thought it was really good. But the MFA comes up several times. You'll be quizzed on it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I know we use it at my company. So, yeah, pretty common. Thing. So uh, the next series of action items tonight are related to the 2023 and 2024 budgets from Laura Smith. Laura, will you please introduce the first item? Yes, thank you, Council Member um, Ryard. So the first one is a budget amendment. Uh, we would actually, we um, published a notice in the legal record on December 5th. Um, I think everyone's aware that when we adopt the budget, each August or September, we set the maximum expenditure authority for each fund, uh, and exceeding that maximum maximum expenditure expenditure authority without formally amending the budget results in a statutory bu budget violation, which we don't like to have from an audit perspective. So, because of the timing of the budget, and because we're adopting budgets, you know, four to five months ahead of the actual start of the fiscal year. Uh, a lot of the numbers that we're using are um, it, estimates and our best guess, particularly as it relates to the timing of large capital projects and when we might have those expenditures and, and reimbursements associated with that. So we do have a need to amend the budget um, for five funds in 2023, the Equipment Reserve Fund, uh, which is a result of uh, supply chain issues. Uh, we have a dump truck in particular that has been on order since 2022. So we're carrying over that encumbrance. We keep thinking every year we're going to pay for it because it's going to come in and it has yet to appear. So um, the capital improvement fund is one that needs to be amended. When we adopted the 2023 budget, we had not yet uh, approved the bonds or issued the bonds uh, that we, the 2022 a series um, that was intended to fund parks and streets projects. And so really the capital improvement fund, the street sales tax fund and the parks and recreation sales tax fund are all being am amended to reflect the receipt of those bond pre proceeds and then the expenditure of the bond proceeds. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, uh, we need to transfer funds from the ARPA fund to the general fund, consistent with the decisions that we made in the 2023 budget. We hadn't given ourselves the authority to make that transfer from an expenditure standpoint. Uh, and so we need to amend the ARPA fund uh, to do that. So again, all of the uh, the increases in the expenditure limits were anticipated and included in the revised 2023 budget that we adopted. Uh, back in early September, so no surprises, um, not the result of any uh, unexplained expenditures or overages. So we will hold a public hearing on the 2023 budget amendments uh, at our council meeting next week, and then the council will uh, look to uh, just adopt that amended budget. And then if I can go through, I think probably if we can pause there and make a recommendation about what, what you want to do with that one, then I'll quickly go through the other two. Any questions or comments before we have a recommendation on that? Okay. All right. Recommend Mitty. we take this non consent. Yeah, regular agenda. Yep. Right. Uh, then the each year we have two housekeeping items, uh, really. Um, we adopt the uh, annual budget by ordinance. Uh, we have no changes proposed to the 2024 budget that the City Council adopted in September. So this would just be a confirmation uh, and final adoption of that budget. 
And then the second one would be um, we authorize you authorize the city administrator to spend according to the 2024 adopted budget. Again, sort of another housekeeping formality. Obviously, uh, that sub that spending is subject to my limit uh, currently of ten thousand um, dollars. So anything higher than that comes back to you. I had a quick question on that. I know we've talked about this before, but just with inflation and everything, do we ever need to worry about or, or even consider raising that limit? Yeah, I'm, I will be bringing back something early next year to kind okay. of look at that. Um, it's interesting, but I think trying to really do that analysis of those things that um, it would just be more expeditious if we could advance them. But yeah. Get them. I just want to commend you we would not be where we are if it were not for your budget expertise. There are city administrators throughout Johnson County that wouldn't pair up in a heartbeat with what well, you do you. for us. And I can't thank you enough. You keep us on the up and up and you are totally appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I have two separate things, uh, recommendations for the 2024 budget adoption. Okay. First one recommendation. <laughs> you have one, Ken? Yeah. <laughs> regular, sure. regular, regular agenda. Okay. Both of them. Both consent. Okay. Yeah. I told council member Chosey in agenda review today, I said, you realize unless that council member Davis has had a conversation um, <laughs> with his spouse about his role, somebody else is going to have to step up and be on the ball to make these recommendations at committee meetings. This was so. not non consent, correct? Uh, both of those uh, typically consent? go on consent. Yes, the budget uh, amendment, no, but these two uh, can historically- Can go consent. They okay. can go then to consent. Let's go ahead and do that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Ken. All right. And our next action item tonight is for consideration of drug and alcohol council recommendations from Robin Volks. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, as most of you know, the state of Kansas imposes a 10% liquor drink tax on all alcohol drinks sold in the state. Um, revenue from that tax is 30% to the state and 70% to the city or county where the tax is collected. Uh, for a city the size of Mission, the portion allocated to the local jurisdiction is proportioned into thirds. So a third goes to the general fund, a third to the special parks and recreation fund, and a third to the special alcohol tax fund. That special alcohol tax fund supports programs with a principal purpose um, for alcohol and drug abuse prevention or treatment of persons who are currently involved with alcohol or drug abuse. Um, the city of Mission in 2024 is estimated to receive about $390,000 for alcohol tax funds. A third of that, about 130,000, will be proportioned for the city's special alcohol tax fund. And the Drug and Alcohol Alcoholism Council through the United Consumer Community Services of Johnson County will take $60,000 of those funds. They use that fund funding to offer grants to organizations throughout the county who provide drug and alcohol abuse prevention and treatment. Um, this would be for 2024 budget. Um, the DAC reviews applications submitted for funding requests. They meet with applicants and develop recommendations for the allocation of the funding, which was all included in your package tonight. Thank you. Any questions, comments, recommendation? Recommend we take this to consent. Great. Um, our next action item tonight is for consideration of cereal malt beverage license renewals for 2024, also from Robin. All right, thank you. This year we have nine cereal malt beverage renewals for 2024. Um, they would be Casey's Retail, CVS, the Hy-Vee Grocery Store, the Hy-Vee Convenience Store, Natural Grocers, Poly D's Pizza, Prairie Sailor, Quick Trip, and Target. All of those have existing CMB licenses, and this would be renewals. Um, all of the companies have paid their renewal fee, done a renewal application, and background checks have been run by the police department prior to approval and issuance of the license. Great. Recommend we take it to consent. Um, and our, is this the final one? Am I, okay, hallucinating. Our final action <laughs> item tonight you might be <laughs> is for consideration of the 2024 Human Service Fund allocation also from Robin. Thank you. Uh, the United the United Community Services of Johnson County is a not-for-profit corporation that coordinates and supports various initiatives and programs for human services needs for Johnson County residents. One of those is a human service fund. Uh, that fund provides cost-efficient and accountable 
mechanism for local governments in the county to support services that help residents facing, facing difficult circumstances. Uh, the Human Service Fund offer, awards competitive grants to not-for-profits in the area to assist with the operation of human service safety net programs that meet the needs of Johnson County residents who live with income at or near the federal poverty level. Uh, this year, the, in 2023, the Human Service Fund allocated $439,040 to 19 separate agencies in the county, um, representing a commitment of 14 cities, including Mission and the county, and the city of Mission contributed $10,000. In 2024, the UCS board is recommending a total allocation of $463,190 in funding. Uh, Mission's contribution will be increasing to $10,500 for 2024, and this amount is included in the budget that was adopted earlier in the summer. I'm happy to answer any questions for you. I recommend we take this to consent. Yes, take it then. Thank you. We have no discussion items this evening. So we'll move into finally uh, department updates. Ms. Smith, are there any department updates for the finance administration? Committee? There are just a few. I know Director Almany has some. I don't know, Chief, do you have anything? You have your cereal. Your cereal. Yeah. We appreciate any cereal you can drop off the police department. Would be great. By Monday is the deadline. So competition with Consolidated Fire District. Um, <laughs> yes, and P peanut butter and jelly. I think they're also collecting this year. And Brian, will you have anything when? Okay. And those donations directly benefit our family adoption program. We've got 90 local families who we've adopted this season, and uh, that's coming up this Wednesday, December 20th. So we'll begin the the food gathering from High V and uh, Lynn Kring, thanks for all of his tireless efforts. We'll pick up food from harvesters and we'll begin staging that Tuesday evening and then uh, delivery to all of those families occurs um, throughout the day on the 20th. So it's, it's, it's great. Special thanks to Cheryl Davis who has been wrapping gifts all day long, all by herself. And she coordinates the volunteer efforts. So awesome. uh, we're in a good place because of her. Thanks. Just a couple of other reminders that I would, would uh, share. Um, it's hard to believe that next week will be our very last council meeting of 2023. I'm not quite sure where this year has gone. And we will have a reception uh, to recognize the outgoing and incoming council members prior to that. Um, also, um, in January, we will be having a presentation from Evergy on some of the issues that we've experienced. I think we can anticipate a fairly strong neighborhood participation uh, with that meeting. Um, so we'll, I'll share out when we get to the committee meeting, hopefully kind of a preview of what we expect to see in their presentation. Um, and then also we will be, the mayor, mayor will be recommending uh, appointments and reappointments to the various boards and commissions uh, next week. Um, we do have some vacancies uh, based on resignations and, and a variety of other things. Uh, so if you know anyone who's interested, we have not had as much interest in terms, I think it may be just time of year if people are busy, but if you know folks, uh, uh, and we're targeting in particular, we do need some ward specific vacancies. So if you have any questions or you know of anybody, please encourage them to send their resumes in so we can get those commissions up to full speed. Could you let us know how, what vacancies are where so we know what expertise to look for? Uh, we have two vacancies on the planning commission. So Brian Schmidt will be transferring to the council and then Charlie Trapito has tendered his resignation. So two, yeah, so we're pretty balanced. Uh, it, it, interestingly enough, our commissions have been more balanced in terms of ward representation now than they have been in a long time. But I'm happy to send out. And then we have, I don't have this one committed to memory, sorry. Um, okay, so we have planning commissioner. We need a ward two and a ward three. Um, sustainability commissioner, ward one and uh, Parks, Recreation, and Tree Commissioner from any ward. I'll, we'll email that out as well, so. And that is all I have this evening. Um, are, do we plan on putting anything on social media or, or uh, really 
getting it out to the public that Evergy's coming. Is that something we want to promote? Yes, we will. We'll get that out when we get a little bit closer and we have a better sense of what they'll be, what information they'll be bringing forward to us. I know they have been out very busy uh, trimming river and, and countryside the last few weeks, but kind of waiting to see that slow down. And then I'm going to ask for an update on some of the other infrastructure issues. And Laura and I have discussed that unlike most of our presentations, which are just sort of one way and not an opportunity for the public to engage, we plan to offer the opportunity for public comments and questions with respect to that Evergy presentation. Oh, yes. And just a reminder too, that the January committee meeting is the 13th of January, not the, uh, is that the right? It's the second Wednesday because basically we'd be having to put a packet <laughs> together in a holiday week, Other the 10th, I'm sorry, the 10th. T tonight's the 13th. Also, 4.30 tomorrow is Prairie. Yes, Prairie Sailor ribbon cutting tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. I'm going to ask a question. Have we gotten any of the funds for the storm no, Chief, you can give an update on that. You're the one who's working that through the agonizing process. Um, that that process will be uh, lengthy. And so we've gone, we have another meeting with them scheduled for the 18th that they're going to give us more more detailed instructions about what we need to do to prepare for that process. Anything else? Feel complete and good? Okay. It is now 8.53 p.m. And with no further discussion, that concludes the meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee. Again, this video will be made public on our website at missionks.org. Thank you.